I've, been att I've attended every FIRE conference, and for me, the highlight every time is uh, Mark's conversation with Bill Janeway. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to that tomorrow morning. Uh, Bill is on the board of directors of Nuance Communications. Uh, Warburg Pincus is Nuance's largest investor. Uh, and uh, that alone makes Nuance a, a subject of fascination for me. If you don't know Nuance, it is the powerhouse in voice and speech technologies. It's, it's a billion dollar company. Uh, and it, it, its heritage extends to just about everything uh, that you could imagine in uh, speech and voice from uh, Ray Kurzweil and uh, his early uh, Omnifont character recognition uh, products uh, to, to Xerox, where Paul comes from, uh, to Learn It and Housebee. Those of you who don't remember that, that was the, uh, uh, the biggest financial scandal before uh, Enron and, and WorldCom, but uh, uh, the, the technologies that came out of that bankruptcy are, are uh, uh, now in nuance, and those technologies and, and brands include Dictaphone and Dragon Systems with their voice recognition and transcription products, uh, and... Uh, uh, Nuance itself, the, uh, uh, the, the company from which it, uh, the, the current company took its name, was an SRI spinoff. So uh, quite a bit there. S since Paul's come on board in 2000, um, the, the company ha has really been on a tear with more than 40 acquisitions, uh, including, I believe, IBM's speech technology patents, uh, TGIX, mobile language prediction software, uh, and all manner of other things. Uh, uh, Paul, perhaps it would be best to start off uh, sort of laying out the history, a bit of the history of Nuance, um, and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, Nuance, uh, as, as you pointed out, has been in the speech and, and language technology business for uh, more than a decade now. Um, and it's a company that has grown through investments in some specific markets and also, as you pointed out, through acquisitions. Uh, the, the company is structured around a core set of voice recognition and natural language processing technologies, uh, and those technologies uh, are deployed in specific markets where we have found speech to be most productive um, and, and, and most useful. And I'll just mention them quickly. The first and the biggest, actually, which is, has, has been a surprise to us because it, it evolved rapidly in the last few years, was in the healthcare market, where doctors uh, in the U.S. alone trans, uh, dictate 30 or 40 billion lines of uh, textual information about their, um, about their patients. And that narrative is important and might come back to some tough subject we might come back to in, in this dialogue. Uh, the, 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 the second business, which was actually the origins of the company, uh, were in, in the customer call center, contact center management, um, also an area that's evolving and we, we might want to return to. And then the third business was mobility. And, and of course, that's, that's become the business of a great deal of focus because the extent to which mobility itself has become uh, such as a centerpiece of, of the computing infrastructure. So you came out of Xerox when it spun off uh, Scansoft, uh, and at some point then Scansoft did a uh, reverse merger and ultimately became Nuance, but the, the Xerox technology was uh, more, was it optical recognition? Yeah, so, so Scansoft, which was, as you say, spun out of Xerox in the, in the late 90s, was a scanning software company that did document recognition and, and had a very good position in document recognition, uh, but um, I, when I joined in 2000, I had some doubts about the breadth of that market um, and thought that there were other markets that offered much more interesting challenges and much bigger market uh, opportunities. And in particular, I believed uh, that speech technology was going to be ubiquitous at some point. It would take some time, but it would be ubiquitous at some point. Uh, I believe that with a little bit of experience we had in doing recognition technologies, I believe that 
there would be people who were infatuated with the technology, but there would be few companies that would keep a sustained focus on it uh, over a decade or more, which is what we believed it would take and indeed what it has taken. And I believe that if we could focus on specific markets as they became, as the technology enabled those markets to be feasible, that we would be able to build a business steadily. As the technology improved, we would find new markets that were available that weren't available in the early years. And, and that, was, uh, that was the basis of our decision in 2001 to get into speech recognition. As you pointed out in your opening comments, Learn It and Houseby was in bankruptcy and provided a terrific opportunity for us to acquire some assets, uh, which became the foundation of the, that initiative. Now, your, your largest vertical market is uh, healthcare technology, yes. is that right? Yes. And w how big a portion of your business is that? So it's about f uh, 40, 45% of our business today. Wow. So yeah. a, a very large. How did you originally get into that business? Did that come with, with Learn It and Houseby and Dragon? Uh, <clears throat> We, uh, in, a, in a, several years after that, we, we found ourselves in a position of, um, of OEMing our technology to a number of firms who were trying to build uh, clinical documentation solutions, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, and we saw our royalties from those, uh, those opportunities rising, uh, and as we began to understand the business, we believed that we could build uh, uh, deeper solutions if we integrated vertically into that market. Uh, so we built some products. Uh, we, we, we brought out a version of Dragon for medical applications. And then ultimately we acquired the uh, business that once was known as Dictaphone, which, which had long since become a clinical documentation and workflow company and gave us a big footprint in large hospitals in North America. Uh, and since then, it's just been a booming business for us. So I, I guess it's the legendary uh, bad handwriting of doctors that... Uh made this a, a natural vertical? <laughs> <laughs> well, doctors, uh, doctors are, are it, 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 it does go beyond that. Doctors uh, have to capture this very rich narrative about the procedure or the patient visit. And if you listen to these, you, you, you understand immediately that they're highly unstructured, they're very dense, they're very technical in their vocabulary. It's extremely infeasible for a doctor to write it and it's, and it's impract impractical for them to type it and, it's, and it's, it's, it's also impractical for them to try and use graphical interface systems to capture all that information. So there, the volume of that narrative that's being generated every year just continues to rise and rise. And the, the opportunity and the challenge for us was how to uh, automate that and, and, and to digitize that because of course at the same time over the last decade, there was enormous interest and in, 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 in more recently government mandates to digitize this information. I, I should also say that the, 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 the capturing of that transcription is, is, is an interesting problem unto itself and is a very productive uh, tool for hospitals, but it really has set the foundation for something that I think is far more explosive in its op and, and that is to take that narrative and using natural language processing to tr transform that narrative into a structured facts that will, that will uh, inform the various processes in the hospital that have to go on. The patient record, uh, the billing processes, and the data analysis that hospitals are being driven to as they're focusing on managing outcomes. In order to, to respond to this government a focus on, on what are the success of the outcomes that go on in a hospital, they have to be able to collect this data, they have to be able to normalize this data, and so using clinical language understanding, natural language understanding applied to clinical information, allows the, the transformation of this into structured information that can, the data analytics can be run on. I, that's where the future of this business is for us, and I think it's a very interesting area. Yeah, it, it seems that there's a certain value in just uh, the doctor getting it down uh, you know, getting this down on paper, so to speak, a, a bigger value in, in the institutional context of, the, of a particular hospital or clinic, but an even greater value then when you begin to build a you know, system-wide, uh, uh, economy-wide database where you can begin to uh, compare data and outcomes, that kind of thing? Right. So hospitals themselves very much want to be able to look at the history of outcomes across their institution. And that's a complex problem, and this is a part of that solution, but it's a critical part of that solution. And then as you, as you refer, as you, as you note, there, there is a mandate to look at outcomes 
across sectors or, or, or in fact, the, the, the entire country. And that, that raises a bigger problem yet, but, but clearly, in order to get there, this unstructured textual information will have to be transformed into some structured format. Our, 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 our biggest hope for Medicare, for example, uh, would be to improve outcomes and reduce costs uh, as opposed to simply cut reimbursement. And, but before you can do that, you've got to get the data, and, and you've got to somehow digitize that. And that's, that's where you're right there at that front end. Right, so I think, I think your point that, that, that the managing the outcomes is, is ultimately, improving outcomes and efficacy is, is, is ultimately the, the, the single most important enabler of, of more productivity in the healthcare system, and that's, that's why there's so much focus on it. In fact, uh, uh, providers are going to be, begin to get penalized after a certain date if they don't do that, is that right? All right, so for the next uh, couple of three years, I've forgotten exactly the, the, the cutoff. There's, an, there's, a, there's a positive incentive. There's a payment if they, in fact, uh, achieve a, a certain level of, uh, of dig digital usage. It's, 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 it's got a phrase in the industry called meaningful use. And then at some point, I think 2016 perhaps, but I don't remember precisely, what, was, what is a stipend becomes a, becomes a penalty. Now, jumping around a little bit here, I, I personally, I was really impressed with the Watson demo, uh, the, the Jeopardy uh, thing that people here might recall, uh, where the, the, the IBM computer Watson beat the, uh, the Jeopardy champs. And it seemed that there was, that was impressive to me in part because of the unique um, structure of Jeopardy, where you're given an answer and have to figure out the question. It seems that, that uh, linguistically, logically, that that's a much bigger challenge than just answering questions. And it, it, when I was watching that, it struck me that the real potential for Watson would be in something like medical diagnostics, where you would be able to, you know, analyze a vast amount of data to uh, to look for patterns. And uh, you you were. You've worked with IBM on some of this stuff, haven't you? Well, uh, we, we have been working with IBM for, for several years now um, through a joint research initiative that the two companies defined and, and some other commercial relationships. About a year ago, uh, Nuance announced an initiative with IBM to develop uh, natural language processing for medical applications, uh, referred, referred to as clinical language understanding. And then some months ago, uh, I think, in fact, just about the time the Jeopardy contest was occurring on the air, uh, Nuance and IBM announced uh, an, an initiative to commercialize the Watson technology for medical applications, and in particular with an early focus on what you just, what you just articulated, which is um, uh, the, the, the improving diagnoses uh, in, uh, in using the Watson system and, and, and Nuance's natural lang clinical language understanding technology to improve diagnostics. Are there particular challenges in the healthcare field in terms of vocabulary, jargon, that kind of thing? Uh, there, there are, uh, of course, uh, and, um, and there, will, there will have to be, uh, the, the Watson system is very impressive, and, and, and in some ways it's a state-of-the-art statistical language understanding system, um, uh, but in, um, in other ways it's a, it's a, it's a very complex uh, architecture, it's a, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated architecture that allows the ability to bring um, a, a great deal of evidence to bear from a multitude of sources, and and it and and it's and it, it employs a very a very sophisticated confidence rating system that tries to honor each of these sources and make sense of them uh, in a way that probably says a lot about the way reasoning systems are going to evolve. And that might be a separate tangent to to talk about. But uh, but in 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 healthcare in particular. Uh, the, the adaptation of this system will require the, the bringing in, of course, of very different sources than the Jeopardy system, um, and the incorporation of prior knowledge in, in, in existing ontologies and other knowledge bases that exist in healthcare, as well as all kinds of textual information, and importantly, um, uh, s structured information that exists in the context of the particular diagnostic systems we're trying to bring to bear. Uh, and I, I think that, um, in a way, the, the way to think about this is it's, a, it's just an incredibly sophisticated context-aware application, uh, context-aware in in in, with respect to 
uh, the patient uh, that, that's being discussed uh, in, 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 in the context in terms of the hospital and its, its history and its, its diagnostic uh, records uh, that exist, and of course all of the textual information that exists well beyond the purview of the physician that they might simply not be aware of that would be bring information to bear um, in this, in, in, all in the, um, in the framework of this notion of what evidence exists to, and, and what confidence can the system uh, uh, um, develop about this evidence trying to structure a hierarchy of diagnosis that, that, that might be probable for this particular event. You man mentioned uh, context awareness, which gets back to sort of the, the front end and uh, speech recognition. Uh, how much of your technology is so, sort of unique to a particular speaker versus um, sort of statistical inference from a larger uh, database of speakers? Well, most of our systems take advantage of, the, most of, all of our systems are so-called speaker independent systems in, 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 in the respect that they, they have developed models that work across a broad, uh, a broad set of users and they don't require training in order to be used. At the same time, all of these systems uh, learn and improve based on the population and on the individual. So uh, the systems we're deploying, for example, for doing dictation on mobile devices, um, take advantage of all the people who are dictating into that system and the learning that goes on, as well as your particular uh, dictation and, and, um, and, and the learning about you and, and what works and what doesn't work. So on the mobile devices, and we're jumping around a little bit here, but it, it's hard not to, uh, you've got Dragon uh, Dictation, Dragon Search, and those are, my understanding, pretty thin clients. Most of that is taking place in the cloud. Very thin that right? that's right. So, um, whereas your desktop, the, the, the more takes place uh, re relative to the mobile, more is, is on the desktop, more is, uh, uh, there's more learning from the individual speaker, is that right? Well, the, 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 there are two separate issues here. One is the, is, is the, is the, is the system and network architecture, and the other is this adaptation that we're talking yeah. about. Um, Virtually all of our systems uh, try and take advantage of the general population and the individual um, because that's going to give you the optimal experience. Uh, the, the, traditionally, the systems on PCs have been, have, have been resident on PCs, and, 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 and one of the reasons that, that the Dragon product on PCs is, uh, is so much better now is that um, the, 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 the computing power on a PC is so much more formidable and, and, and able to, to use models that run across much larger data sets. But to, to your architectural point, I, I think the normative system that's going to exist, particularly in a mobile world, is going to be a hybrid system that has some intelligence and uh, is, is, is speech recognition embedded on the device and some in the, in the cloud. Um, and there are reasons for this that have to do with latency, have to do with interference of bandwidth, have to do with where the content it's actually accessing is located. Um, and, and we see that in the best systems that are being deployed on phones today. The, the state-of-the-art systems are hybrid systems that, that take advantage of the, te of the technology on the device working in some fashion with the, the, the software in the cloud. On this architecture issue, you made a, a comment to me the other day that sort of stuck in my head as a way to uh, think of this, which is your initial challenges were sort of fell into the category of what am I saying, whereas you've evolved now to where the, the challenge is increasingly what do I mean. Uh, let, let's take first of all the what am I saying. Uh, uh, that seemed to be more of a, uh, how to put it, sort of grammatical or rule, uh, uh, rules-based challenge. What were some of the, what were the, the big challenges that you've had to overcome S simply on that question of what am I saying? Identify the words that a speaker is speaking. Well, I, I want to I correct something I may have misled you the other day. The, what, what I was saying was that the, the, the problem of recognizing the words, the so-called speech recognition problem, is transforming into a natural language processing problem. Yeah. The intention of the words, the meaning of the words. 
I should clarify, though, that speech recognition has been highly statistical for quite some time now. Um, uh, the, um, the, the famous, one of the famous uh, legends in, in, in speech recognition technology, Fred Jelinek, who, who, who died unexpectedly last year, uh, in, his, in one of his early textbooks wrote that every time he hired a linguist, his, um, every time he, he hired a linguist, his, the recognition uh, of his engine went down. Um, and um, uh, his, I think his point was that the, the focus on data and empiricism in the models was what was really driving improvements. That's been true for quite some time. That's been a different story in natural language processing, where uh, and, until more recently, in natural language processing, uh, it was viewed more as a kind of classical AI problem where there was a use of rules, there was use of all kinds of knowledge engineering technologies that tried to, de to develop abstract representations of the knowledge. Um, and, and that has yielded significantly, not entirely, but significantly to, to, to statistical tools which are able to take advantage of large data sets um, and, and, and machine learning technologies that exist today. And that has really moved the, for, the, the, the frontier of that capability forward very quickly, very fast. So given the words that preceded and the words that follow, what, what is, this, what is it, this sort of word that's unclear in between, what is it likely to be? Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Well, uh, that is one of the techniques. But, but there, there are statistical techniques used. There are a variety of statistical techniques used to say, uh, given a, a large set of data, how might we how, how might we try and discern intent from this, from, 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 from this language? So um, uh, I, it's, one, it's, one speech, it's a speech recognition problem to know that I say, um, I want to make a restaurant reservation. It's a natural language processing problem to understand that the actual action that I want is to make a restaurant reservation. And, and, and in fact, the mobile systems that we're, we're, we're seeing now and we're going to increasingly see are going to be intention-based and, and action-based. And sometimes they're referred to as virtual assistants. But, but the, the, the state of the art now has moved away from just being able to capture the text and now being able to act in a variety of ways on the intention of that text. And, 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 and that, that's just to, just to round that up. I think we can think of that as a subset of the whole problem of context-aware computing. Uh, which is taking advantage of lots of information. Another piece of information, for example, might be the location. You could imagine that, that taking advantage of your location and understanding that I want to make a restaurant reservation would give you more insights into what the individual is really trying to do. Another piece of information might be the history of the restaurants that I, um, that I, uh, that I like um, and, and so forth. So in, in, on, the, on the bit about just identifying the words that are spoken, um, what what challenges have you faced and overcome there? Uh, one example that comes to my mind is with uh, Shazam, for example, which those of you who don't know it, you can hold it up to a, a music playing in a Starbucks and it will identify what the song is. Uh, and it seems to have developed to where it is very robust to, to background noise, not just sort of white noise, but even... Uh, other sort of interferences. And I guess what they do is uh, they have this three-dimensional graph that they take off a spectrogram that, that with amplitude, frequency, and time, and, and they just take a, a, a sample of the most energy-intensive moments, and they only need about three per second for five seconds to be able to tag it, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, do you do things like that to capture in terms of being able to actually capture the spoken words against background noise and that kind of thing? So uh, the, the problem of a noisy environment is one of the central challenges of, of speech recognition. Um, and uh, there has been significant improvements in, 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 that, uh, in that area of speech recognition. Uh, there is a, a, a long ways to go. Uh, the, 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 the application that's interestingly brought the, the greatest challenges there is the automobile, um, where, where, of course, we have all kinds of ambient noise. And, and, uh, and so a, a lot of our research has gone into how to reduce the noise, the signal to noise problem in, 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 autom uh, in automotive uh, applications in particular. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a problem. The device you have, of course, 
doesn't allow for a, a, a very close microphone. And so the, 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 noise, the, the, the noise issue for you speaking in any normal way into that device uh, is, is, is going to be greater than, say, if you were wearing a headset with a microphone. And that device has actually two microphones, and so there's, there are technologies that can be used to array those microphones to take advantage of that, and there are other technologies as well. That's an area that, that um, it continues to evolve, but it's a, it's a central challenge in the technology. And it, it, it's particularly important now because so much of speech recognition is, is situated in the mobile, in the, in, in the mobile setting, where, where, the, where the noise problem is greater. And, and also in the mobile setting, it, increasingly it, the, the processing takes place in the cloud, is that right? Well, again, as I said earlier, there, there's, going to be a, there, I, there's going to be for a long time a, a hybrid solution that, that processes, the, 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 that does some processing on the device and some processing in the cloud. Mm -hmm. But to be sure, there, there will be a, a, a increasing proportional reliance upon the cloud because of the, 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 the greater proportion of, of the processing power available there and the ability to process much larger data models there. So, so as y y the challenge moves more into just crunching a lot of data and statistical analysis in, you know, in big, in, in big uh, uh, servers, uh, in, in, it strikes me that what that the natural language understanding challenge logically is somewhat similar to search and, and the things that Google is doing. Do you see, if you're looking out five, ten years, to what extent are you sort of converging um, on, uh, on, on search? Well, I you, think... You mentioned in, intentionality, for example. I, I think I would turn the problem around, which is that natural language understanding and, and, and search are elements of this broader problem of context-aware computing. And so if one looks, for example, at the Watson system, the Watson system relies upon search tools, a variety of search tools, as one of its, uh, as, as one of its array of, of technologies, some of which were specifically developed for Watson, some of which were assumed from the industry and from other work done in IBM. Um, and, and so if we go back to this, in, this virtual assistant, I, I don't think that it's going to converge on, it's so much that natural language processing is going to converge on search. I think search is going to move towards, uh, towards uh, natural language processing and towards this intentionality. I, I, uh, I don't know if, 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 if that's a significant distinction, but, but that's the way I think of it. Yeah, the search now doesn't seem... Uh, to take into account as much the structure of the language is what you're doing, obviously. Well, there's a lot of semantic processing in some search, yeah. so I, I and and there and 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 natural language processing on textual information and natural language processing on on voice created information are, are in fact converging. So we will see we will see very similar NLP technologies being used in both. So you also deal in different languages, right? How many languages does uh, do you offer Dragon in, for example? Uh, I think Dragon, the mobile Dragon, is currently supported in something like 20 languages. Yeah. And uh, are, the, are the natural language understanding challenges transferable across all those different languages? Uh, you mean as a canonical across yeah, all? Yeah. Uh, essentially, yes. So if you have sort of figured out the... Uh, the canonical uh, uh, meaning or understanding of a phrase in uh, Belgian French, and you've also uh, figured out what that is in Swiss German, it seems like it should be a fairly easy logical leap to then translate from Belgian French to Swiss German. Is that true or not? Well. I, when I said canonical, I meant that there's, a, there's an architecture that is transferable, there's a technology right. architecture that is transferable across languages. I did not mean to imply that there's some kind of canonical knowledge representation that these various languages target. Um, and, and your question is alluding to that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. 
which has been the uh, approach of many of the translation systems that were done over the last 30 years, and it's proved very tough sledding uh, for, for reasons that go back to this earlier conversation of, um, of, of the use of knowledge engineering and, 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 and knowledge representation and, and, the, and the difficulty of extending those systems beyond narrow domains. The, 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 the state of the art in, um, in, um, uh, in machine translation, in, 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 in language translation today, is much more statistically based. So it's, it's, it's relying a lot less on this kind of normative representation model than it is on using these machine learning tools uh, to, to translate from language to language. So you're not in the translation business now, is that no. right? Is that something you see yourself going in, getting into? We have made some investments in that, and we have actually uh, we have actually uh, used we've deployed a system uh, that combines speech recognition and and language translation, and we'll see where that goes. Yeah. The and do you see some of this? Uh, uh, it seems like it could lend itself to literacy challenges in in the developing world and and things like that. Machine translation. Yeah. Yes, I think that's true. Um, and, and in fact, one of the interests in speech recognition in the developing world is the high levels of illiteracy. One of the, uh, we, we've had a good deal of success uh, with the Indian uh, carriers, the wireless carriers in India, uh, because they're interested in deploying speech recognition very broadly uh, to parts of the population that, are, that, that, that don't have literacy and therefore um, the spoken word is going to be an important form of interaction over the device. Mm -hmm. Does your, to what extent does your technology lend itself to identifying the speaker as opposed to what the speaker is trying to say? When, when I answer my phone with an extraordinary degree of accuracy, I can identify in the first few words who, who is speaking to me on the other end of the phone. But like like facial recognition, it seems that that has been a harder challenge for our machines. Um, we've had a speaker, so-called speaker identification technology available for a number of years now. And every year in the company, the, the marketing team, this was going to be the year in which that technology was going to get broad acceptance and take off. Uh, and I, I, I became skeptical about that. But I will say, in the last year or two, we have seen far more interest of that than we've ever done previously, and that is, I think, because of mobile deployments. Uh, the, the, as, as institutions move to managing their customers in a mobile framework, security um, in, in, in mobile devices, securities, uh, in, security in that, uh, in that access becomes important, and, and voice identification as one form of a multi-factor security strategy seems very appealing, and there's been more interest in that in the last year than in the previous 10 years combined. So for example, verifying financial transactions by your voice uh, fingerprint. Exactly. Uh, that sounds fascinating. Then, just as with facial recognition, humans are very good at detecting emotion. You know, is, is, is this person happy? Is he stressed? Is he lying? Uh, and we also pick that up from voice. Now, that seems like long term a huge challenge to try to uh, detect from voice uh, but, you know, a person's uh, emotions, feelings, but that gets ultimately to intentionality. It, it does, and, and, and there have been emotion detection offerings available, particularly in the call center recording business, the business where companies record the, the call, you know, you call and the call center says you may be recording this for quality purposes. And there have been emotion detection systems available for some time based on using uh, various kinds of recognition technologies. It, it doesn't seem to have been a profoundly productive business. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it gets a lot of interest, and it gets, it, it gets a fair amount of press. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't gotten nearly as much uh, attraction in the actual market. So I, I probably should just touch upon uh, your relationship with Apple. Um, they're a customer of yours. When you do the, uh, the voice button on the iPhone 4, that's your technology. Is that right? That's true. Um, and uh, there, there have been rumors that you might be an acquisition target. And uh, I'm not uh, expecting you to comment on that. But what would be interesting is sort of your vision for 
uh, where speech is going in mobility. What's, you know, what's our interaction with our mobile device going to look like in, in five years? Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to talk about Apple specifically at all, but I think I can talk about where m mobile, the, what I believe the, the mobile systems are going to look like in, in, in the next three to five years. And some of it is, is consistent with what we've spoken about already this morning. Um, I, I think that uh, search is going to move to intentionality, and so the, that what you want in a mobile setting is, 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 is not the downloading of a lot of information. What you want is to get at specific information and, uh, and to take action on that information, and, and, and doing that will be, again, very context aware. It will take advantage of the things you've asked about before. It will take advantage of actions you've taken before. It will, it, it will take advantage of information that might be available from your social graph, from your calendar, um, and uh, your location and other things. And, and uh, we, we are seeing early implementations of that now, um, systems that, that have, have, have been talked about. For example, the Siri system that Apple bought is a good example of early work in that area. But there are others. Um, some of Nuance's um, uh, drag and search technology shows some, some early signs of this. I think that's going to develop very fast over the next three years, and I think we're going to see that become a standard capability uh, in, in, in smartphones as if we look out in three to five years. So we're going to use that little uh, touch keyboard less and less over time. Right, we're going to use the touch keyboard less and less, and we're, and we're, we're, we're going to move to a much more intentional uh, uh, base command with our device. Um, 45 minutes seemed like it was going to be a long time for this panel, uh, but I, I've really touched on probably a quarter of the things I had noted down to, to talk about with you. So it's, it's, it's sort of frustrating because we, uh, there's so much more we could cover, but we're, we're down to about five minutes. And if, uh, if anybody wants to ask some questions, um, go ahead and line up and, uh, and we'll call on you. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll just soldier on here. Hi, Sri Jagannathan from Intuit. On the one hand, voice seems like such a compelling human interface. So if I wanted to communicate something to you, it's easiest is for me to speak rather than write and have you read it, right? But the same message, if I wanted to, let's say, do it through a machine, have it transcribe what I'm saying, have it reconverted as an email to you and then read it back to you, chances are it'll get garbled. So it's an unfortunate case where voice has not really uh, yielded the promise that it has. As an ISV, uh, as Intuit creates software, whether it's Mint or QuickBooks or QuickN and so on, to us, voice is still not there in terms of an interface. So we don't think of it as the mode by which customers interact with their uh, you know, potential, the function points that we implement in software. And that's because in many ways, it's not quite there. It might be 95% there for some things. It might be 80% for some people and 92% for someone else, et cetera. So it becomes an interface which is not reliable. So I'm curious, as a, as a vendor of software, how we should think about it. So one thing which would help is, let's say, uh, uh, an interface which advances voice. So I can see a keyboard, particularly for mobile, which understands what I'm trying to say, and the keyboard rapidly changes so that I can quickly ensure that my intent is made available and therefore understood. The so second thing I'm curious about is whether that some of uh, knowledge in this industry is, uh, my, would comprehend a better solution than the individual players. So different players know different things. Maybe the aggregation of that yields a 99% solution. And the third is whether there are software modules that can bring, that can, let's say, advantage players like us, which should be plugged in to the function points that we are creating in software so that we can yield a solution to the customer. Okay. Well, let me try and comment on a few of the things. Um, I started out this discussion by saying we, I believed when we got into speech recognition that if we were prepared to take a long view of this and, and uh, cultivate and shepherd the technology over a decade or more, that we'd make real advances. And that part of the challenge we would have was identifying which, which markets were enabled at which point in time by the progression of a technology. That was true 10 years ago, and it's true today. So I don't dispute that the technology may not be the right technology to, uh, to obviate the use of the mouse and the keyboard for someone trying to use Quicken. 
uh, that's probably a pretty refined interface, and, and I'm not, it's not surprising to me that, a, that particularly a data-intensive application like that might be very well served by, by, that, by, by the current system. Uh, at the same time, 50% um, of the physicians in the United States today use speech recognition technology uh, because it's a, it's a system that has proven to be quite felicitous in, in, in capturing their information in, in, in a more productive way. And, and uh, with respect to your last question, um, Nuance has made its technology available to developers uh, uh, throughout the industry uh, if, uh, based on, on its developer tools from, from our cloud, and, and certainly it, in, in, Intuit could take advantage of those. Uh, it's a very practical way to proceed. I, I, I do think ultimately the technology will be embedded in more and more applications. We're working with a number of firms who have internet services offerings that they want to voice enable in various kinds of ways. And, and, and that may be true for very specific modules for you, but that doesn't mean it's going to obviate what the, the, the primary interface you have today. Is that Craig? Yeah. Hi. Craig Vashon from Immersion. Um, Nuance is seen as a, a business that's created itself around its IP. There's a lot of folks that are concerned that the IP, the, 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 the patent system may be broken in the United States. In a utopia, what does Nuance see as, as you know, some fixes to our, our, our patent system and to IP in general? Oh, I don't, um, I don't uh, presume to have any, any insights on, on, on our intellectual property system or, or, or the patent system. I, I accept that, that the patent system has evolved and will continue to evolve. Um, uh, intellectual property is a property and property laws are important and, and uh, the system will, will evolve to help manage that. I, I'm, I'm, it's not an area of my expertise. And it's a fascinating question, Craig, and, and hopefully we can get uh, Mark to let us do a panel on that at, uh, at a future fire. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, the Andersons are strict taskmasters uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the time of these panels. Uh, as I said, I'm frustrated because we only barely touched upon some of the really exciting things Nuance is doing. And, uh, where that technology is leading us. Thanks Thank a lot, you, Paul. Thank you.